Hello, and welcome to Let's Just Talk. I'm your host, Han. Today, we're joined by Dr. Lyle Goldstein to discuss U.S.-China relations as it relates to the Taiwan Strait and Russia-China relations as it relates to the war in Ukraine. Dr. Goldstein here is a visiting professor at Brown University and the director of Asia Engagement at Defense Priority. He was a faculty at the U.S. Naval War College for 20 years and continues to be one of the world's foremost experts on the Chinese military and security policy. Dr. Goldstein, welcome to Let's Just Talk. Glad to be here. Dr. Goldstein, you, along with many of your colleagues, have been ringing the alarms that humanity faces, faces an existential threat of a nuclear catastrophe, which would literally mean the end of organized human life as we know it. You have called the Taiwan Strait the most dangerous flashpoint on planet Earth. Before we jump into the details, can you begin by contextualizing why addressing the Taiwan issue is so crucial to the survival of organized human life? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you put it that way. I, I think the stakes are that large. I think it's often uh, not fully appreciated, Hami, that uh, just how dangerous the situation is. You know, there's a a tendency kind of in uh, strategy circles, foreign policy circles to think, you know, well, a tweak here and a tweak there or a new missile system or a new radar or something like this will, will you know, swing the balance in one way or another, you know, and kind of obviate the necessity of some horribly catastrophic war. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think so. I think, unfortunately, at, at this point, we are on a collision course with China. Uh, I think that war would be uh, terribly bloody and costly all around. But you, your point is exactly right, that uh, there is a chance uh, that, that uh, this could result in a nuclear conflict and, and you know, a massive nuclear conflict of, uh, you know, that could threaten the planet. Uh, so I'm glad you put it in that context. The fact is nobody knows what would happen in, as far as use of nuclear weapons. Uh, we may hope that they would not be used you know, that cooler heads would prevail, um, that one side would blink. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there are plenty of scenarios that, that point toward uh, just, uh, you know, an escalation spiral that mm -hmm. uh, does result in a major nuclear exchange. So, you know, I, I might mention a few times today the, uh, this recent report that came out from uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies mm -hmm. that tried to game what a Taiwan scenario would look like. And it really is, you know, I commend it to all of you. Uh, it has some flaws in my view, but mm -hmm. uh, it really is the most detailed examination of what a war would look like. But right. crucial caveat, they have ruled out any use by the players in this game of mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. But, you know, that begs the question. Right. And it says so at the end of the report. They said they ha we have no idea whether nuclear weapons would be used or not. Right. Uh, so we all had better keep that in mind and I think act with all due caution. And, and I mean that Beijing needs to act with caution and so does, so does Washington and so does Taipei, by the way. And what do you say to people that always make the argument um, nuclear weapons are like fancy cars that, you know, you live, you live in your garage, but you never drive it. And so it's just to showcase that you have it and you know you can use it but you're never going to use it it is just a form of deterrence mm -hmm. well there's something to that of course and so far i think we've been uh fortunate that uh, it has stayed in the garage as it were but uh i don't think we want to take risks uh, mm -hmm. in this regard and I, in my view we have been taking risks and when i say taiwan is the most dangerous place in the world you know i don't say that lightly i mean i've been watching the korean peninsula very carefully i've watched Sino-Indian relations and the India-Pak conflict in the Himalayas, of course, in Kashmir, mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, and of course, there have been a lot of nuclear shadows over the Ukraine conflict. So I'm well aware of all of these dangers and uh, I'm truly uh, shocked and really appalled uh, as a global citizen to see uh, right. that the nuclear threats are there in all these situations. And uh, I don't think that... Uh, you know, either the public or really the leaders are, are grappling adequately with the risks uh, mm -hmm. because um, once one is used, I think it's more than likely yeah. many will be used. Yeah. Uh, and then, it, it, you know, it would not be difficult for it to uh, spiral out of control from there. Uh, you know, moreover, as we see the 
proliferation of more and more states having them, that mm -hmm. also, uh, you know, exponentially increases the uh, likelihood of use. So we seem to be coming more and more up to the line. And one mm -hmm. more thing I'll say, Ami, in that regard is I think, I think my parents' generation, mm -hmm. maybe your grandparents' generation, you know, they lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis right. and other crises, right. you know, uh, around the world, you know, Dien Bien Phu, the Mediterranean crisis in 1973. Mm -hmm. There were many, many crises and all of them were very scary where the superpowers came to the edge. Right. They lived through that uh, and uh, they were rightly scared by that mm -hmm. and it affected their policies and the way they thought about these things. Mm -hmm. They were very, uh, they, I think, uh, both societies, um, the Soviets and American society and much of the world adopted this kind of cautious outlook. But I think recently there's just less familiarity, less, um, and people seem to be uh, more casual about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a massive mistake. And, and so right. I think part of my role here is to uh, bang the gong and warn people that this is real, this could happen. Right, and then uh, for our audience, can you take us back to the 1940s and explain why Taiwan is so important to China? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, um, if you look at a map, you'll see very clearly that uh, why, uh, you know, the, the fate of Taiwan and China are closely interlinked. Uh, right. Yeah, that, that's quite obvious just geographically. Um, but, you know, historically, this goes back many centuries. And uh, really, Taiwan was brought into the Chinese empire as it was the Qing, Qing Empire. Qing Dynasty uh, in the uh, 17th century, mm -hmm. right? Even before the United States existed, let's keep that in mind. Right. Um, but uh, right, the the key moment to understand, and I really urge all of you to review this history. That is to you know to go back and try to understand what happened in the late 40s and the early 50s, because mm -hmm. it's it's so critical to understanding the situation we find ourselves in. And there were some very severe Taiwan crises during the 50s that look a little similar to what mm -hmm. we're facing now. And by the way, the United States threatened to use nuclear weapons in, in those situations right. in 1954 and, and 58. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the critical um, event was when the uh, communists prevailed in the civil war and the nationalists who had ruled China uh, for a couple of decades uh, they were forced to retreat, uh, mm -hmm. and they retreated to to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And this is actually an echo of Chinese history when right. remnants of the Ming Dynasty retreated there um, back in the 17th century. So, um, in my view, that is absolutely critical because it's important to realize that this is a, um, you know, uh, and I'm not. I, I don't have a pejorative meaning here, but but it is a uh, it is a family quarrel, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and you feel that you know I was just in Taipei, and you feel mm -hmm. that everywhere in Taipei, right? Um, and it's not just that Mandarin Chinese is the you know official language of Taiwan, um, but it's that um, uh, you know I, I I want to emphasize this and maybe underline it two or three times is that. The United States has intervened in civil wars all over the world, right. you know, from Vietnam, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, you name it. We're involved in somebody's civil war. Mm -hmm. And this has been shown again and again to be a catastrophic mistake. Right. So I would invite my uh, uh, fellow Americans to think very hard about uh, before getting involved. Uh, seriously involved in this dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for my part, I think there are ways to help uh, Taiwanese and, and mm. uh, the, the Chinese government reach an accommodation uh, that doesn't involve bloodshed. Uh, but it also doesn't involve, you know, uh, weapons and, and wars, more to the point. I, th I think mm. there is a political solution to this uh, uh, Gordian knot. We'll talk about that political solutions later down the line. Sure. Um, before we jump into that, can we discuss why... Taiwan is important to the United States, or why does the United States want to be involved in this so-called civil war? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, let's see, the, I mean, there are people, of course, who believe that, you know, the argument is made frequently in D.C. that that uh, Taiwan is a vital interest of the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. Uh, I think uh, 
that's a vast exaggeration of Taiwan's importance. Mm. Uh, but, you know, these people who make that argument uh, use a number of, uh, um, uh, you know, points to, to make their um, case, to make their case that the, the, they will uh, talk a lot about microchips, for example, and say that, well, American industries would be hobbled if they didn't have access to right. Taiwanese microchips. Um, you know, I, I don't happen to agree, but, uh, the, you know, there is that argument. Uh, people say that this is, um, you know, a, uh, a flowering democracy, mm -hmm. a great example of, of uh, human rights. Now, uh, I think it, they all will admit that, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, Taiwan was a very autocratic government, mm -hmm. uh, ruled with an iron hand, and, and many, uh, I had to, hate to say, many um, terrible things happened there during the period of the Cold War, mm -hmm. when they were still a friend of the United States, and yet, um, you know, famously, uh, some, some terrible incidents occurred um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, against intellectuals and so forth. But, you know, uh, similar things happen elsewhere, too. But, uh, but it, what I'm saying is there's sort of a human rights type argument, there's an economic argument, and then there's also a strategic argument that is made uh, to argue in defense of Taiwan, and that one concerns, you know, uh, in its kind of robust, most robust uh, form, people say, well, Taiwan is the cork in the Chinese bottle. Right. And if we were to uh, allow, you know, Taiwan to be, mm -hmm. you know, as it were, the Chinese bottle to be uncorked, that, that uh, Taiwan, you know, China would uh, be free to, its Navy could, could mm -hmm. uh, you know, fully, uh, how to put it, rampage across the Asia Pacific. Again, I, I don't find any of these arguments persuasive, not mm -hmm. the economic one, not the human rights one, nor the strategic one. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, they seem to uh, gain a lot of currency in Washington. Wow. Okay. And then uh, there are a lot of conversations around Chinese military capabilities um, in the likelihood of conflict. And you have often agreed, agree, um, argued that the military balance is changing. Um, for example, China has hypersonic weapons that the United States simply does not have. Mm -hmm. And then you also talk about cyber capabilities. Um, can you help our audience understand how China is preparing for amphibious warfare, where things to, escal where things to escalate in the, in the region? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, th this is kind of where I spend my day-to-day uh, -day work, sort of refining my understanding of the... Uh, um, the military situation across the strait. And I think from Taiwan's point of view, it's quite bleak. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the um, look, uh, China is a military superpower. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it has a strong army, a strong navy, a strong air force, uh, a strong missile force. And on top of that, you know, a strong coast guard. And then they have uh, very extensive uh, reserves that can be mobilized. So uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, at some at some um, at some level, I I believe this is just common sense, and people need to grapple with common sense. Right. And, and it's not just the way you know the tremendous imbalance of you know resources, military and otherwise, uh, but also um, you know that the simple fact that that Taiwan is ninety miles off right. of China. So if you want to conceptualize this as Americans say, think about Cuba. Uh, it's a nice island. It, probably, you know, has very motivated people and mm -hmm. maybe, a, you know, you know, at, at certain points had a reasonably well-equipped armed forces, but how long could they hold off the, the United States? Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably the United States could conquer Cuba with just the army, forget the Navy and the Air Force, or just the arm, or just the Navy and forget the army. And, you know, right. you see what I'm saying? It's just a sort of and by the time we get over there, it's, it's probably yeah. Too, if, and I don't think China or the Soviet Union could rescue Cuba. And and yes, I mean the same is true uh, mm -hmm. in the case of Taiwan. You know, so again, it's just an application of common sense. But then again, you know, I'm happy to talk through the details. Uh, you know, China is not just ahead of us, but seems to be far ahead in critical areas like anti-ship cruise missiles. I mean, look at the YJ-18. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a supersonic cruise missile that seems to be better than any uh, naval crew, any ship cruise missile that we have, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of uh, range or speed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, now they have apparently put aboard ship the very first uh, hypersonic anti-ship uh, missile mm -hmm. 
you know, no other Navy has that. Um, and uh, that, that's a big breakthrough. And, you know, uh, to me, uh, we, we don't want to uh, blunder into war and underestimate the opponent. And so I think we have to assume that these weapons probably work as advertised. Mm -hmm. And China seems to do a heck of a lot of weapons testing. Um, so anyway, that's a long way of saying that uh, I think, um, it, look, it's not to say that if the, if the United States and China went to war um, in the middle of the Pacific or even over the fate of Japan or, you know, right. something like that. I think the situation would be quite different. You know, I don't mm -hmm. think China is in a position to project power into the wider Pacific right. in a very robust way or into the Indian Ocean or something like that. So, but this is just 90 miles off China shore and geography is so important when it comes to warfare. So, so look, you know, I see a lot of people reading um, the lessons of Ukraine and I think we will talk about Ukraine some, mm -hmm. but, you know, one of the lessons would seem to be that the defense, um, you know, defense, defense dominance, given, you know, the state of weapons technology, javelins, stingers and things like that. So it's not to say that uh, Taiwan has no chance at all. Um, sure, under some circumstances, they might be somewhat successful. But to me, uh, if China goes all in and every indication is that it would, mm -hmm. that uh, I think that uh, China would probably win in about six to 10 weeks. Wow. Um, those are statistics that are startling, so I want to take a second for that. Um, tensions over Taiwan are not a new phenomenon. You've mentioned earlier 1954. Um, so we can go back 1954, 1958, 1996 for examples. Um, and mainland China has been very clear and consistent over the years about where their red lines are when it comes to Taiwan, which includes things like no stationing of foreign troops in Taiwan, but the United States is currently in Taiwan. Um, and for the past 50 years, most of the world has followed the one China policy of strategic ambiguity. Um, on the Chinese side, that meant something like one country, two systems. And on the American side, that meant not offic officially recognizing Taiwan as an autonomous region. However, we saw Pelosi travel to Taiwan, um, and the U.S. now runs routine multinational naval operations in the Pacific. Um, how do you foresee the Chinese responding to this? Um, granted that you say you just said something like, um, if they were to go to war or like pull a full-scale invasion of Taiwan, they could take it over in ten weeks. Yes, I, I think that um, your point is a very good one, that uh, our, um, you know, our policy seems very poorly aligned with strategic reality. And, mm -hmm. and there, I think some reform is necessary, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we have had this policy of strategic ambiguity uh, and also, you know, as, as a kind of bedrock principle there, the one China policy um, which, by the way, you know, to my estimate, at least three American presidents have, you know, firmly put their seal on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would include in that, uh, you know, Roosevelt, Truman. Yes. So from that er very early period, uh, if you go and look at the documents, you will see. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that both those presidents, Roosevelt and Truman, considered Taiwan to be very much part of China. And that's, you know, that's in the written record. Mm -hmm. um, but reaffirmed, of course, uh, by Nixon, who, you know, ultimately made the, as it were, the ultimate, you know, deal of the century that allowed us to have uh, normal relations with China, of course, uh, in the period of the 1970s. So um, those compromises were made. There were effective compromises. Um, we should stick with those compromises. And that shows us a path forward. And the leaders at that time were very wise. So they knew that those compromises would enable a long period of peace. And they mm -hmm. have. And we've been enjoying that peace during our lifetime. So we don't want to allow that to break down. So if we're wise, we would stick with these policies, um, and particularly the one China policy, and realize that more or less Taiwan is part of China. We accept that. And we hope that they can achieve, you know, kind of a peaceful, um, if you will, coalescing, you know. Now, whatever form that takes is up to them. And they have to figure that out. And I don't pretend that that's a simple process. Uh, but I don't think that the United States really should play much of a role there other than to, you know, 
hope that that it ends, you know, that that it that reason prevails and a compromise uh, um, is uh, undertaken. And and I I think the record shows that there are ways which Taipei there are formulas that that Beijing and Taipei can both live with. Let me uh, give you an example. In 2015, at the end of 2015. Uh, Xi Jinping met with um, Ma Ying-jeou, mm. uh, the leader of Taiwan. So there you go. You know, the, the Chinese leader and the leader of Taiwan sat down, had a very amicable conversation mm. by all accounts. That implies that this may not be that hard. And so you mentioned um, the acceptance of uh, Taiwan is a part of China. That's a statement that may set a lot of people off. And that may make a lot of people angry. Sure. And so um, how do you then reconcile the differences within the country, this country, where um, some people within Taiwan do view Taiwan as a part of mainland China, whereas others who are separatists do not view uh, Taiwan as a part of China. So then if truly a peaceful resolution is possible, um, what would this look like in terms of reconciling these two groups? Yeah, right. Uh, look, I don't pretend this is easy. And if I were a, uh, if I lived on Taiwan or something, I maybe I would have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, and, and I certainly can sympathize with the people there, especially you know watching what they have seen in Ukraine and watched what they've seen uh, in Hong Kong and so forth. So it, it, you know, I don't mean to be callous uh, toward their uh, viewpoints, but you know. Uh, Unfortunately, people don't always get what they want. And, you know, that's the sad truth. And compromise um, involves, uh, you know, often sort of painful political trade-offs. And here, you know, I would su suggest that Taiwan could get probably 80 to 90 percent of what it wants in mm -hmm. terms of autonomy uh, simply by kind of going along and, and uh, you know, go, going good faith into negotiations. Uh, in my view... What do you it, mean by what it wants? Well, I mean, look, I take it for granted that, you know, any given uh, person wants to maximize their autonomy, right? right? Their rights across the board. Uh, at some point, we, anybody to live in a society, curtails some of their rights mm -hmm. in order to live, you know, um, uh, in, in a society. So where that line is drawn in any given circumstance is very difficult. Right. Uh, I would think, in my view, and, mm -hmm. and I don't think this has been adequately explored by scholars, right. uh, and certainly not by policymakers, but I mean, to my estimate, there is a confederation solution mm -hmm. where, again, Taiwan enjoys very substantial autonomy. And indeed, that was the you know, fundamental basis for Yi Guo Liang Zhi, which is one China, uh, two systems. Mm -hmm. and. China has not abandoned that. They uh, view that as a viable approach to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Now, we can spend the next hour debating what happened on Hong Kong. It right. is a sad situation. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was fated to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think both sides um, kind of they developed into an escalation spiral mm -hmm. that led to conflict. Fortunately, not many lives were lost. Mm -hmm. that's, that's actually the good news here. But that, you know, clearly Hong Kong has been uh, suffered a kind of level of severe repression. Um, and I hope that doesn't happen in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it could be much, much, worse. much worse. <laughs> and so um, the Ukraine conflict has many wondering, could Taiwan become the next Ukraine? Um, how would you characterize the current state of China-Russia uh, relationship? Well, okay, that's a series of, of tough questions. So, yeah. Um, but let me answer your foremost question there on China-Russia relations. I mm -hmm. think you have a uh, quite a strong partnership. I call it a quasi-alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, look, Chinese these days are at pains to say this is not an alliance. You know, nothing special to see here. Really, mm -hmm. you know, they, you know, clearly for for commercial reasons related to sanctions. I think they don't want to be too you know, closely associated with Russia. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're going forward with a, a very robust set of uh, 
military exercises across the board. So it's it's plain that the you know there's a high level of cooperation and the, mm. the uh, economic relationship continues to increase mm. uh, at quite a rapid pace. Uh, on the Russian side, of course, I speak Russian and and follow uh, Russian affairs carefully, and mm. and you know they they're very uh, pleased with their relationship with. China, by and large, and 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 thankful to China for kind of throwing them a lifeline right. in terms of uh, in an economic sense for mm -hmm. kind of if you will for defending them in some respects, uh, and uh, they're quite dependent, of course, on China too. So um, anyway, I, I think look, I think the relationship is is quite stable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a cliche, but it's quite true that that China is in the driver's seat. Right. right, Russia is increasingly dependent on China. Mm -hmm. China is clearly the more powerful country mm -hmm. uh, in almost every respect. And has the Ukraine crisis impacted this relationship in any way? Yes, I think it has really increased that uh, Russia's dependency on China, for okay. sure. Um, and has it brought them closer, you would say, or no? Well, that's, that's a tougher one. Uh, in some respects, yes, uh, I think you know the urgency certainly on the russian side to vastly you know increase trade is there uh you know from russia's point of view they want to increase relations on all respects mm -hmm. and, and you know this cut through a lot of roadblocks i mean previously if you went back 10 years ago uh, there was a lot of head scratching on the chinese side so why don't, why don't the russians ever want to finish these projects you know why we talk about things but we don't seem to get them executed the, the russians seem to be kind of reluctant a lot of time to cooperate with china and now that's all gone. Right. So uh, they're moving forward quickly, and and we see new bridges, new new rail connections, uh, roads. It's new, new uh, you know. Apparently, Chinese cars are all over Russia now, and and a lot of changes like that. Huawei has become very influential. So um, you know, underneath that, I do think there are some currents of tension, uh, mm -hmm. but but those afflict you know any relationship. You know, I, the Russians, I think would like to get more support, of course, in the war, I think. Uh, and the Chinese, again, are there a bit... China is very reluctant. It has it has good trade ties, especially with uh, Europe, and they're very reluctant to sure. see, see those uh, get... Um, um, you know, crumble really, yeah, China. really crumble because of the uh, tensions with Russia. And we saw, you know, just in the NATO summit in Vilnius, you know, there's a very tough statement against China and that, you know, I think that makes the Chinese uh, worried and upset that their relations with Europe are, are really uh, in a kind of downward spiral. And um, but ultimately, I don't think that they would, you know, this idea that the China is on the cusp of sort of abandoning Russia or, mm -hmm. you know, saying forget it with this, you know, Russia is not worth saving or something. Like right. that. I don't think uh, that's a possibility. I don't think that's even a possibility. I mean, there, there are very close ties between uh, Beijing and um, and Moscow, and they, they there really is an alignment of kind of perspectives and worldviews, and a lot of it has to do with it. They think that the United States is uh, has been um, too aggressive and throwing its weight around. Right, and then um, speaking of throwing their weight around, what are the implications of? Uh, this China-Russia relationship for the United States and NATO. Because yeah. trade-wise, if you think about it, all of their markets are intertwined in ways that they can't untangle without ruining their economies. Yeah. Um, but you listen to Washington and China and Russia are their boogeyman. Um, but then again, militarily, they seem to be all opposed. So what are the implications of this uh, relationship once again. Well, th that does seem to be an unmistakable tendency toward, uh, you know, what I guess I would characterize as as bipolarity. You mm. know, this kind of new bipolarity. We could say it's like, you know, hey, we're going back to the 1950s where mm -hmm. the world is divided into these two blocks, and we're kind of at the edge of our seat, mm -hmm. wondering whether there's going to be a war here, a war there. Uh, and, um, you know, the, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of sparks flying everywhere from, from difficult relationships. And, and here, arguably, it's even worse because you have a, what seems to be, you know, a decoupling or de-risking, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. process underway to kind of uh, 
with this you know new ethic of that we are we were not going to trade with the other block mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to be dependent and um you know i do i do think that's very troubling and i would strongly urge that we reconsider that i i think it's mistaken for so many reasons but you know just getting to the basic question you, you seem to be hinting at the economic costs and they're there i think that they're immense i mean you know we now have uh over 10,000 sanctions leveled against uh, Russia, um, and those affect, you know, all kinds of world markets. And, you know, I, we constantly hear discussions of inflation, this and inflation, that, but like, you know, hardly anybody raised the issue that the bedrock, uh, um, in my view, uh, reason for inflation around the world has been the war in Ukraine. And, uh, and a lot of the kind of, if you will, secondary effects, including, you know, this kind of de-risking from China and so mm. forth. I mean, it makes an immense headache for anybody trying to do international trade uh, to try to find their way uh, through uh, this maze of sanctions. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't doubt that some people are making money off this, uh, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but mostly, you know, to my estimate, uh, the people getting richest off all these sanctions are all lawyers, you know. Right. Um, how, is that really helping the world? Is that making us more efficient? Is that helping uh, mitigate climate change and things like that? So I'm I'm very concerned, and it seems to me that these we're, we're every time we put some kind of new sanction on a different country, whether it's North Korea or Venezuela or, or uh, you know Myanmar or or Russia, of course, it's you're you're putting another shackle, another chain across the world mm -hmm. economy, and you're slowing global growth and making it harder and harder for. Um, people to do business. So I'm uh, myself, you know, we, we have enough problems. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just listed those. I mean, the, probably the, the biggest threat other than nuclear conflict is climate change. And we right. should be focused very much on that. We should be working with, uh, yes, China, of course, Every India, of course, possible. Russia too. Russia mm -hmm. is a huge uh, energy uh, provider yeah. and, and a, a producer of hydrocarbons. Right. And if, by golly, if we don't have Russia on board, then Russia may play the spoiler and uh, we are going to have vast troubles reigning in uh, climate change. They also, you know, they have a huge patch of planet Earth. So mm -hmm. this is, we also have to be concerned about that. So, you know, by golly, let's get our priorities straight. Right. Let's focus on climate change. Let's mm -hmm. focus on keeping the global economy a humming, uh, you know, to the extent that we can do that in an mm -hmm. environmentally safe way. But um, you know, let's just let's not just make the lawyers rich, <laughs> right? Um, in other words, there's no better time to go to law school than now, um, <laughs> it's, right? Study trade law and focus on sanctions, <laughs> right? Um, I'm gonna have a career change after today. Um, but jokes aside, you just came back from a long from a trip um, from Asia, where you met with many experts on U.S. Russia China relations. Um, what were the general views? of those experts from the ground on the matter um, and Russia being a nuclear power, how did they envision the Ukraine war coming to a halt or the tensions over Taiwan unfolding? Granted, you met with a lot of people, so take your time. Yeah, you know, I met with uh, uh, a couple of dozen top specialists uh, on this trip while I was in China, I also visited Taiwan and South Korea as well. So, you know, I got a look at the region. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I must say, um, people were very pessimistic about U.S.-China relations. I was asked on numerous occasions, you know, are we really going to go to war? Are our countries really going to go to war? And, I, you know, what, how does one answer that question? I, hopefully not. Course, yeah, hopefully not is exactly what I said. And I said, I'm doing everything I can to prevent that. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, one, one very um, famous uh, Shanghai strategist said to me, point blank, he said, yeah, because I, I said to him, why, why is China building up its nuclear forces so rapidly? And I expected, you know, it's quite common for Chinese to say, oh, that's not, it's not really true. That's uh, they're just rumors or something. He didn't say that at all. He said, said we're preparing for the worst case mm -hmm. so yeah. the views are not yeah. so very very pessimistic view uh mm -hmm. in a, just a kind of sense uh 
you know, I, I think the same uh, the same strategist said, you know, we we are on un- we are undergoing self criticism now. Mm-hmm. Uh, why why we Chinese were not harder did not take a more hardline policy against the United States from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So you know, you know uh, how to put it. I mean, China. China has lots of hawks. There's no. Uh, nice there are hawks in Washington. There are hawks in Beijing. So yeah. we responsible people, in both sides of the Pacific, have got to rein this in. Mm. Um, on the China Russia relationship, you know, I, I think a lot of Chinese are, um, you know, like like many around the world, they're saddened. Uh, it's not only giving them a huge headache, certainly from an economic point of view and a mm-hmm. diplomatic point of view, but also, uh, you know, that they, they, they see they're very aware of the the human costs and the destruction. Right. And I think they wish that that more could be done to stop it. Uh, 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 you know, they do. Many of them do um, mm-hmm. uh, put some blame on the West there. Um, but we, um, I think that they. You know, I guess the bottom line was put to me by a, by a very uh, senior Beijing strategist who said, he said, look, Lyle, you know, um, it's not that China needs Russia to win or something like that, mm-hmm. uh, but that they, but they cannot allow Russia to lose. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think, I think that probably encapsulates kind of the, Ru- the, the Chinese uh, position. Uh, that that really they they're too invested in Russia. They need mm-hmm. Russia in many ways, right? Uh, and they realize that if Russia were to lose uh, fully, as it were, that in their view, all the pressure now on Russia would now arrive at China's doorstep, right? And the pressure on China would be uh, enormous. So that that's really their bottom line fear. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you have argued multiple occasions that Russia Ukraine conflict could have been avoided. Um, that is a unique perspective. How so? Because Washington doesn't seem to think so. Um, and what can we learn from this? Also, like, is the art of diplomacy still a viable form of engagement? Because um, I, I forgot where I read this article that was like something like the art of diplomacy is dead. Um, but anyways, let me hear your take on that. Well, I mean, I'm also uh, a bit pessimistic. I think that article, you know, it, it does seem to explain a lot, I, it, you know, just from what I'm taking from the title. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen much diplomacy. Uh, I'm sad to say, you know, our Secretary of State has not seen fit to pick up the phone and talk with a Russian foreign minister, which I find shocking, you know, because I feel like um, those wouldn't be happy conversations, but these are conversations that have to be had, and and it's not going to happen in an hour or two either. This mm-hmm. would be, uh, you know, maybe there are conversations happening behind the scenes. You know, one hears about the CIA director traveling around, for example. But mm-hmm. uh, to my view, we absolutely need diplomacy here. Um, you know, I don't. I think we have a military stalemate. I don't think either side is is about to uh, roll over the other one. Uh, mm-hmm. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of dead, maybe starting to near uh, a million when we think about the, all the people wounded. Uh, it's horrible. And um, yes, to my view, this was preventable. Uh, I think smart diplomacy going back two or three decades, you know, I think our, our leading statesmen, you know, people like George Kennan foresaw all of this mm-hmm. and warned us uh, about the consequences of, say, NATO expansion. Uh, I don't know that my view is so unique, actually. You know, we have, uh, you know, leading scholars at Harvard, at, at uh, University of Chicago, at, you know, other right. uh, esteemed institutions that have said the exact same thing as me, that, that smart diplomacy, uh, uh, restraint, realism, that those uh, principles could have found a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, You know, look, this was aggression, absolutely, and Russia should be condemned and punished. And, and you know, I think, honestly, I think they have been. I think Russia has been severely humiliated, mm-hmm. uh, rightly so. But, you know, we cannot escape some culpability ourselves right. for this mess. And... I, th- I believe it was an interview with Obama where he was asked, um, could they have done anything to prevent this um, back in, I think, 2014 or something like that? And he mentioned how uh, they did the best that they could, 
based on the resources and the information they had at the time mm -hmm. and also based on the willingness of the Ukrainian population mm -hmm. to sort of engage in addressing this issue. Yeah. I, what do you I make think, of that? I mean, I think President Obama had a really important understanding and the right understanding of this conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, he saw it for what it was. He understood that this was a kind of, you know, um, uh, yes, a conflict between two states, but also a conflict between, you know, two nations that are very closely related. Mm -hmm. And he knew, uh, you know, his critical insight was, uh, well, there were two. Well, one, he understood that Russia was always going to have more firepower, you know, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And that is as true today as it was back in 2014 as it was in 1991 uh it, it that is not it hasn't changed it's not going to change right and you know our failure to grasp that fact you know has has it's in my view has led to again hundreds of thousands of people being killed if we had simply understood that reality and mm -hmm. and and you know as a result president obama was very cautious with this he didn't want to send lethal aid he didn't want to get further involved in this mm. uh struggle and he realized that we had to favor political diplomatic settlement and just you know sort of come to some kind of agreement even if it wasn't very pretty and that's exactly uh what he did so i, I think he had uh you know the right approach using realism and restraint uh, I only wish, you know, we had stayed with his policies, but instead, you know, uh, Biden uh, and Trump, um, you know, so uh, b both took a much more confrontational course. And that's partly why we're in, in a, this total mess that we're in today. And then uh, you spent 20 years at the Naval War College. Mm -hmm. um, you left the Naval War, Co the United States Naval War College, partly because of ideological differences. Um, you have been an advocate of pursuing diplomatic uh, resolutions on these issues as opposed to military ones. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think there is such a reluctance to design an inclusive security ac architecture that welcomes China and other countries, Japan, Philippines, Australia, all the people in the Pacific mm -hmm. um, into this new model of like inclusive security approach that avoids nuclear conflict yeah well i did you know I, I decided to leave the government for many reasons uh but yeah a lot a lot of it was just kind of lots of red tape and uh, but um and also you know I, w I wanted to try something new and i love being at brown it's it's a wonderful atmosphere for scholars uh you know where you know people are welcome to uh, hold uh, different kinds of views and and uh, to do you know uh, work in, in a whole variety of areas. So it's, you know, whenever you leave the government, it's kind of like, you know, you walk into the fresh air as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this has been great for me. Um, so, and just so thankful uh, to Brown for welcoming me in. And the, the students are awesome too, <laughs> let me say. Why, thank you. Um, but um, you're right. Uh, there, there is this uh, tremendous reluctance to, to take a more kind of, uh, inclusive approach. I, I strongly believe that's part of how the Ukraine war came about. You know, we, we started kind of othering Russia to uh, to an extreme degree. You know, this, you know, got worse and worse and worse until we ended up in a war. Um, and uh, I think this is happening in East Asia too now. And it seems to be the same kind of set of processes. And unfortunately, you know, I, I was recently li listening to some Chinese scholars that they're using the same exact, um, you know, they have a similar understanding. That is, they, they think, you know, all the lessons that uh, uh, that were learned in Ukraine are, are now being applied to, uh, to containing China. Mm -hmm. And they similarly think that they, um, you know, that they're, as it were, being provoked. So, um, to me, uh, we've got to step back. We've got to look at the big picture, make priorities, you know, climate change. It requires the great powers can get along, can talk to each other, mm. can, you know, realize um, agreements. Uh, same on the economy. So there are, you know, these critical, uh, it's of critical importance that we embrace cooperation mm -hmm. uh, for the future of the planet. 
but <laughs> but even if those uh, somehow uh, those imperatives do not persuade you, then just think of the incredible risks. And here we're talking Humane. about uh, yes, talking about nuclear risks. Uh, these are are not just great powers which can uh, make horribly bloody wars as they have in Ukraine, but they are also, you know, wield the ultimate uh, weapon, mm -hmm. um, as do we. So we have a responsibility um, not to uh, lose this beautiful planet that we have and to seek for peaceful solutions. Uh, and uh, I don't see nearly enough of that. We, we really, I think we need to um, take all that intellectual power at all our uh, universities around the world and apply it to, you know, searching for cooperative solutions. And it doesn't mean we have to like each other so much. It just means we have to try um, to Enough get along. not to kill each other. Yeah, um, exactly. So, and I think the solutions are out there to be had. So mm. we just, this is why, so I think it might be for your generation though, to, to really push this forward. Hey, that's a heavy, thing to place on my generation, uh, but we have to figure <laughs> no pressure. out. <laughs> no pressure. Um, lastly, I want to be able to end this conversation on a good note. So are there any signs of peaceful resolutions or cooperation that you've seen? What can we do to avoid this looming calamity? Hmm. Well, look, here and there you see maybe some hopeful signs. Um, I was very encouraged by uh, Secretary um, Yellen's visit to Beijing following after uh, Secretary Blinken. Mm. So, you know, this seems to show like some sense in Washington that there is uh, got to be, um, you know, a way forward, a way to um, uh, reach some kind of just general um, agreement on, on um, how to go forward in all these uh, conflictual areas um, where we might, you know, compete, but, you know, compete responsibly. And hopefully we can begin to take, you know, the idea of armed conflict. Uh, we can put that on the shelf somewhere. Um, mm. And the idea of war between the United States and China should once again become remote, which is where it should be very mm. remote, I would say. Uh, even on the Ukraine uh, war, you know, I, I have even seen some hopeful signs there that, we, again, we're, we've arrived at this stalemate where so much blood has been paid. Um, you know, the lines, though, have not moved very much. And I think both sides are coming around and, and, and really around the world, coming around to a sensibility that the carnage has to end. And right. we need to draw together and, and think about how do we rebuild Ukraine mm. uh, and, you know, overcome this, this horrible tragedy. All right. Dr. Bolson, it's been great having you on Let's Just Talk. I look forward to continuing this work with you. Thank you.